begin. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar series today. Today's webinar, like all webinars, is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing through geodynamics.org. During the webinar, please use the chat window to type in your questions or to communicate with others. During the Q&A session at the end of the talk, please either indicate in the chat window that you have a question or turn on your microphone in video so we can see that you have a question. So today's webinar speaker continues on this year's theme of geodynamics in the classroom. Today we are fortunate to have with us Professor Eric Mittelstadt, who is an assistant professor at University of Idaho, where he has established the Idaho Geodynamics Group upon his arrival there in 2013. Undertaking studies into a wide range of topics, including plume ridge interaction, faulting, and hydrothermal flow, Eric and his students employ fieldwork, laboratory models, and state-of-the-art numerical simulations to push the boundaries, excuse me, to push the boundaries of our knowledge of the Earth. He is also one of the co-developers of the code SISTER, which stands for Simple Stokes Solver with Exotic Rheologies. This code simulates the sphere and mantle deformation. Today, we will hear more about his modeling methods in his talk, Where Have All the Dimensions Gone? Hands-on methods for introducing students to non-dimensional numbers in laboratory and numerical modeling. So Eric, the screen is yours. All right, thanks a lot and welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, uh, signing in. I'm gonna share my screen here. We'll get to the PowerPoint. And let's start it up there. Okay, yeah, I'd like to thank CIG for inviting me to give this talk and uh, I'm excited to introduce this uh, way I like to start off students talking about non-dimensional numbers. I don't know about all of you who teach students out there, but usually when I try and introduce non-dimensional numbers to undergraduates or early uh, graduate students, they often have a hard time with some of the concepts. And so what I'd like to walk through today is a little bit of how I introduce students to non-dimensional numbers and why we use them in both laboratory and numerical geodynamics. Um, so the first thing I I'd like to do is I like to introduce students to the fact that they use non-dimensional numbers in their daily lives already. Then I like to show them that by non-dimensionalizing equations, they don't actually change the fundamental the nature of those equations. They aren't invalid because they non-dimensionalize them. And then I use a simple example problem as opposed to having a complex physical problem like mantle convection that they may not understand uh, and have to grasp the, with the physics. I do a simple problem that they have already seen in their early physics classes and use that to introduce non-dimensionalizing equations and deriving non-dimensional numbers. And then finally, we get to the hands-on part of introducing students to non-dimensional numbers where I have them actually do a physical experiment in the lab to prove that non-dimensional numbers can do something for us. So at the end of the lecture I give on introducing students to these concepts, I expect them to be able to do a few things. First, of course, would be to describe a non-dimensional number and, and what we use them for. Uh, then to list at least two reasons why non-dimensional numbers are useful in laboratory and numerical modeling. And then to provide an outline of the steps involved in non-dimensionalizing equations at a minimum, and hopefully they could actually take an equation and non-dimensionalize it after going through this exercise. So to motivate the students uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I suggest to them that there are at least two questions we could answer uh, with non-dimensional numbers. And the first has to do specifically with laboratory modeling. And I discuss with them that there are a lot of people who try to simulate uh, mantle dynamics using sugar syrup or corn syrup. Uh, they, this ranges from doing subduction experiments to doing plume upwellings. And I asked them if a sugar syrup can actually represent the mantle. And if it can, how do we know? And then I postponed the answer to that question to say, well, we're gonna look at how non-dimensional numbers may help us answer that question. And then the other motivating question I asked the class is I say, well, how do you efficiently conduct a numerical or laboratory for that matter study that has tens of different variables? Uh, if you're doing a, a plume study like the image here shown uh, with the aspect code, um, you know, you could change the, temp the excess temperature of the plume, you could change the uh, temperature difference across the mantle, you could change the viscosity structure, 
how do you efficiently conduct a study where you don't have to run hundreds of thousands of simulations or conduct hundreds of thousands of laboratory experiments? Uh, and I suggest to them that by understanding non-dimensional numbers, we can also help conduct studies more efficiently. With that motivation, then I like to take students through what they already know but don't realize about non-dimensional numbers. So I start with things they run into in their daily lives. So for example, in cooking, if you're gonna cook, say, hamburger buns pictured here, there's always a constant ratio, mass ratio, of, say, flour to water. So for hamburger buns, that happens to be two to one. So we know that if we have two kilograms of flour, we have one kilogram of water and the dimensions cancel. So this, as students can see, is a non-dimensional ratio they use or could use every day. And the key to this is that if they wanted to scale up and say make 500 hamburger buns as opposed to two, or if they wanted to make the biggest hamburger bun ever, all they have to do is keep the ratio of flour to water the same. Another example of a non-dimensional number that students run into in their daily lives all the time is pi. So pi is a dimensionless ratio of a circle's circumference to a diameter. I'm sure everybody on the call realizes this. But it, it gives us a lot of information about the geometry of a circle without ever having to solve an equation or, um, or get into any of the details about how that uh, the radius to circumference is described mathematically. Pi tells us something about that geometry intrinsically. So if you take all this information about uh, ratios they use in their everyday uh, lives, including pi and the cooking ratio, we can break it down into things the students know about dimensional numbers already, but haven't really framed it in the way we would uh, in geodynamics. So they know that dimensional numbers are ratios of quantities that contribute to the physical behavior of a system or equation, like the baking of bread. So the ratio of flour to water contributes to the way that bread bakes. They also know that dimensionless ratios allow comparisons of systems with identical physics, but at vastly different length, time, or mass scale. So the comparison of a small hamburger bun to the massive biggest hamburger bun ever. Uh, have those two bake in the same way, they have the same physics, and so that ratio tells us that the physics of those two situations are the same. Students also, real, or also know, but don't realize, that dimensionless ratios can often provide insight into the underlying physical properties of a system without solving an, any equations. So, for example, the geometry of a circle, we know something intrinsic about that geometry when we know uh, the value of pi. So once I've introduced students to this idea of dimensionless numbers and the fact that they already know something about it, it's time to take the next step and to jump into a little bit more complex, more geodynamical situation that we're interested in. And what I like to do is I flash an equation like this up on the board, uh, this being conservation of momentum of a viscous fluid. And they, all the students who haven't dealt with mantle convection or or uh, slow flowing fluids kind of freak out and they see this differential equation and you tell them, well, we want to non-dimensionalize this. And all they can think of is, oh, this is this super complex non-differential equation. I can't even think about what it means to non-dimensionalize it. And so what I find is very useful is to abstract this equation. So we have three terms here. We have a divergence of stress, we have pressure gradients, and we have buoyancy. And we can abstract those terms as shapes. We say, okay, to our students, we can say, okay, don't worry. Don't worry about the details of this equation right now. This class is all about understanding non-dimensional numbers. So let's just abstract the equation and say we have a triangle-shaped mess plus a circular mess is equal to a square mess. And this is a true description of conservation of momentum. It's just written in a different way. And regardless of how you write conservation of momentum, if all the terms that these shapes represent are the terms in conservation of momentum, then it's a true statement. And we can take this a little bit further with the students and say, okay, well, what if we were to, to divide both sides of this equation by triangle mess, triangular shaped mess? Well, 
what that would do is it would non-dimensionalize each term in the equation. And we know this because we know the dimensions of triangle mess, circle mess, and square mess all have to be the same or the original equation wouldn't make sense. Right? We can't have triangle mess having dimensions of temperature while circle mess has dimensions of velocity. You can't add those two things together in an equation. So the students can see right away that by dividing by triangular mess, we've non-dimensionalized all the terms and we now have a non-dimensional equation. They also know from basic algebra that if you divide an equation by the same thing on both sides, you're not changing the nature of that equation. So they see from this abstract representation of conservation of momentum that by non-dimensionalizing the equation, they haven't changed the fact that this equation is still true. It still describes conservation of momentum. And finally, the last thing that you can point out to the students in writing this equation this way is that we know something about the relative size of some of these terms. So we know that triangle divided by triangle is equal to, has a ratio, uh, and it's equal to one. And if we could estimate the sizes of circle over triangle and square over triangle, and if one of them was much, much smaller than one, we might be able to, in fact, simplify our problem already and say, well, maybe that term isn't very important and we could drop it out of our, out of our equations. So they've already, just by looking at this abstract representation of an equation, learned that just non-dimensionalizing equation and looking at the size of terms may allow us to simplify the math we have to do. After I've introduced them to this abstract way of writing the equation, I like to then say, okay, if we non-dimensionalize our equation, there are often terms that show up in it that are uh, ratios of constants that are non-dimensional numbers. And we are going to use a simple, this is where I introduce the simple problem to get at non-dimensional numbers and prove that they show us something or have power uh, to describe the physics of a problem. And so the example problem I like to use is usually something that all of the students have seen in their basic physics classes. It's a harmonic oscillator, or in the case of what we're actually going to use, is weight on a, a, a spring that obeys Hooke's law. And we're going to look specifically at the period of oscillation of this mass on a spring. Uh, so, you know, it's helpful to remind the students what period means and describe some of the uh, basic terms like amplitude or initial displacement and that the spring constant describes uh, the basic strength of the spring. But then I like to give them a goal. And I said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the period of oscillation of spring B here shown in the picture, but we're not gonna do any measurements on spring B. In fact, we're not gonna touch spring B we are only going to be able to calculate the period of spring B by doing measurements on spring A, which is smaller, has a smaller spring constant. And that is going to represent our laboratory model or our numerical model. And it's going to be a, we're going to use that to predict what the period of spring B is or the earth. And so I give them this challenge and then I say, okay, we're going to take, we're gonna have a little plan of attack here on how we're gonna do this. We're gonna use non-dimensional numbers so that the students can prove to themselves that non-dimensional numbers allow us to do this prediction by capturing the physics of the problem. So the first thing we'll do in class is we non-dimensionalize the appropriate differential equation and rearrange the terms to find a, not a dimensionless number. And then we find that the value of that dimensionless number using an experiment where the students actually put a mass on a spring and test the value of the non-dimension of the period of variation of spring A, use that to calculate the value of the non-dimensional number and predict the period of spring B. So I'm going to take you guys through how I run this prop, this in-class exercise. Uh, and the first thing I do is I give the students because most of them have never non-dimensionalized an equation uh, ever, I give them a series of steps that are involved in non-dimensionalizing equations so that they can kind of follow a recipe. So the first thing I tell them to do is 
after they identify the, equ the appropriate equation is to identify the dependent and independent variables. So in our case, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, our equation is that of a simple mechanical oscillator. And it just is found, and you can show this to the students, it's found by setting uh, you know, F equals negative KX, setting that equal to Newton's second law, or uh, F equals MA. And you end up with mass times the second derivative of displacement with the time plus the spring constant times displacement. And so you ask the students to identify the dependent and independent variables. And of course, that's the independent variable is time and the dependent variable is displacement. And then you say, okay, we've got our independent and dependent variables. Our next step is to scale those variables by some kind of characteristic value. And at this point, you tell the students, don't worry about what this characteristic value is. We're just going to scale our uh, independent and dependent variables by some characteristic value that describes our problem. And so this gets them moving forward without having to think too hard about what is meant by characteristic value uh, at first. And so here uh, I've shown the non-dimensional numbers where we have a non-dimensional displacement indicated by the overbar is equal to displacement over the characteristic displacement. And the same thing with time. Non-dimensional time is equal to our dimensional time divided by our characteristic time for the, the problem. And so once they have their scaled independent and dependent variables, the next step is to insert those into the equations and rearrange the terms to find their non-dimensional number. And so they rearrange their scaled values to plug in for X and T, which is what's done in the first line there, and then rearrange those terms to get the non-dimensional ratio that's in red uh, on the bottom of the equation. So we have a non-dimensional, that equation now is non-dimensional second derivative of displacement plus a dimensionless ratio times non-dimensional uh, displacement equals zero. And so the final step for the students is to find a value, a characteristic value for XC and TC. And you can suggest to them in class that uh, either you can get them to come up with these or you can suggest that they could use the initial displacement as a characteristic value for displacement. And then they could use the period, which is really what we're after in this exercise, as a characteristic time for the, the problem we're interested in. So, um, and you can justify this by saying, you know, the period represents a, um, you know, remind them that the period represents the time between the, the mass going down, going back up and coming back down, and really captures the behavior of the system that we're interested in. So after they've gone through all these steps, they are left with their non-dimensional equation with a constant, a non-dimensional constant C, and that non-dimensional constant is equal to the period squared times the spring constant divided by the mass on the spring. And this is where I like the students to step back for a second and think about just by doing this, what they can learn. So they've non-dimensionalized this equation and they have this non-dimensional constant. And it describes, because it's constant, it describes the period for any combination of spring constant and mass. So in other words, this constant describes the physics that govern the period of oscillation of any spring mass system that obeys Hooke's law. Um, and the other thing that I like to point out is that X naught, or the characteristic displacement, has no part in this constant. So not only have we shown that the period is described by this ratio of period squared times K over M uh, for any spring mass system, but we've shown that you can get rid of a whole variable that you don't have to test if you were to run experiments to look at the, this physical process. In addition, you can say, well, if we think about the initial variables we had that we could have potentially tested. We had X naught, the period. Uh, we had uh, the spring constant, the mass. And now we just have one value we would need to vary to look at all of the behavior 
that we could expect from this spring mass system. So we've really reduced the number of free variables we would need to change in an experiment to test, to, to cover parameter space. And then after we've taken that step back and discussed this, I like to say, okay, now you're gonna prove it. You're gonna prove that this constant C is describing the physics of any spring mass system. And this goes back to that goal that I set forth at the beginning of this example problem, that they're gonna measure the period of oscillation of spring A and predict the spirit period of oscillation of spring B. So I give them uh, a, a spring stand, a couple of springs with known spring constants and some masses. And for those of you interested in doing this type of example uh, experiment in your classrooms, you can get two spring stands, springs and masses for less than $100. Uh, so it's definitely uh, usually affordable with class fees, if uh, that is the structure you have at your university. Um, and then I give them the experimental procedure. So I say, okay, place spring A on the mass, put 20 grams on it, um, displace the spring a small amount, and count the number of oscillations in 30 seconds. And this is important uh, depending on the springs you're using. Usually it has to be a longer amount of time 30 seconds at a minimum, because the difference between one spring and the other uh, can be three or four oscillations. Um, and so it's important to have them count for at least 30 seconds. Then I tell them they're gonna record this information on a data sheet, calculate this non-dimensional constant that we derived, and predict the number of oscillations for spring B. And then I have them measure the uh, number of oscillations for spring B in the same way to prove that their prediction uh, was correct. So here's the type of data sheet I give them. Um, the divide by zero here is just because I haven't put in numbers uh, for the number of oscillations. But I give them a spring constant for spring A, a spring constant for spring B, and I tell them what mass to put on the spring. Uh, if you're doing this in the classroom, it's useful to give them the mass to use because uh, if they have too little mass, the spring can start to oscillate like a pendulum. And if they have too much mass, they can pass the kind of Hooke's law limit and their predictions won't be as good. So it's, it's worth testing this beforehand. And then I have them go ahead and do this experiment. So just for a little fun, I made a video of spring A oscillating and all of you out there can uh, try and count. Let's see if I can, oh, that's not what I want to do. Um, yeah, so go ahead and count when I start this video. I recommend you tell your students to count the number of times the uh, weight gets to the bottom and use that as a way of counting the number of oscillations. So we will count for 30 seconds here. Okay, so it's a little harder to do this, uh, not in front of an audience, so I'm not sure how you guys, your guys counting worked out, but I counted 73 oscillations. Um, some of you may have gotten, oh, there is chat. Okay, Lorraine got 70. Uh, it is a little hard to count. Sometimes people report 74, sometimes 72. Uh, it is about 73 and 30 seconds, but <laughs> Lorraine says she blinked. Okay, um, but we get about 73 and we can use this to put it into our data sheet. So if we put 73 into the data sheet, uh, I will automatically calculate all values. If we put 73 in, we get a period of oscillations of 0.4 seconds and a dimensi dimensionless ratio equal to 70. So the students would calculate this dimensionless ratio and then calculate backwards to get the number of oscillations they would expect for in 30 seconds for spring B. Uh, 
And once they have that, they should get about 79 oscillations. They can again go through and do the experiment again, but this time for spring B and with 90 grams of weight, which is what I told them to use. So it's a different spring and a different mass. And they've predicted the number of oscillations and we can again go through and count. So get ready, I'm gonna play a video again and you guys can go ahead and count and see if you get 79. Okay, so did anybody get 79? Maybe, let's see. No, Lorraine got no. How many did you get, Lorraine? <laughs> 65, ah, oh. well, I'm curious how well the video comes through. Um, I have actually gone through this slower than real speed and I actually get 79. It, oh, the video is jumpy, okay. Well, unfortunately, that makes it difficult to count, but uh, in the lab, I promise you will get 79, <laughs> uh, as predicted. Uh, some of the students might get 78, they might get 80. You could have them do this in triplicate if you wanted to. Uh, but the key here is that the students will get a value that's close, very close to what they predict. And this shows the students that the non-dimensional number C that we've calculated using this simple problem that they've all seen before, accurately describes the physical behavior of this different spring mass system. It's a different mass and a different uh, spring constant. And by extension, they can understand that this non-dimensional number C describes any spring mass system. And this allows you to have them answer those questions we asked at the beginning of the lecture. Does convection in a sugar syrup tell us about mantle dynamics? And how do I go about efficiently conducting a numerical or, for that matter, laboratory study that have tens of variables or more that I could potentially vary that could uh, test the physics? And so um, those of you online, I'm sure, know the answer to these questions, but when you're talking to your students, you can tell them that, you know, yes, convection in a sugar syrup can tell us about mantle dynamics if the physics are the same. So just like if the physics of one spring or the other were the same, they both obey Hooke's law, then they should have the same value of this non-dimensional constant. And if they have the same number value of this non-dimensional constant, then one can be used to describe or predict the other, just like spring A could be used to predict the periodicity of spring B. So for mantle convection, of course, you can introduce the Rayleigh number, and talk about how this tells us about the ratio of thermal buoyancy to viscous resistance to flow, and compare the Earth's mantle to various laboratory fluids. And now that they've seen a non-dimensional number in action, hopefully this gives them a better understanding of why understanding if the value of the Rayleigh number is the same for these two situations, that we would be looking at the same type of physical process. The other question I posed at the beginning of the lecture for the students was, how do you officially conduct a study with many, many variables? And again, you can use the Rayleigh number as an example. Um, you can mention that the Rayleigh number has eight different parameters that uh, go into it, into this ratio. And if you were to vary each of these parameters to test its impact on the physics of convection in the mantle, and you say you tested five values of each of those parameters, you'd be running almost 400,000 simulations or 400,000 laboratory which of course is normally untenable. Um, and even if you were to test five values of only three of those parameters, you're still looking at 125 simulations to look at them each individually. Uh, but if you were to use this non-dimensional number, the Rayleigh number, as all of you know, uh, you only have to vary one number and you could end up doing five different uh, simulations. So that makes your study much more efficient and allows you to uh, understand the same behaviors or range of parameter space than you would have running 400,000 simulations testing the, very, the differences of every single variable.
So hopefully that gives you some ideas on how you might introduce uh, upper level undergrads or you know, just starting graduate students who are starting to learn about modeling and getting into the uses of dimensionless numbers. Uh, and when they walk away, they should have some understanding uh, of what non-dimensional numbers are, that they are ratios of the governing parameters of a physical system, like this k p squared over m that they calculated for the mass spring oscillator, that by non-dimensionalizing an equation, you're not changing whether it is a true statement, that dimensionless constants allow scaling of physical processes in analog models to large, often inaccessible Earth systems, uh, and that finding the appropriate dimensionless ratios for a given problem can reduce the number of simulations or laboratory experiments that are necessary to test uh, all of parameter space, or so the range of physical behaviors of the system. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Eric, for that presentation. I know the next time I'm in the kitchen with my daughter baking a real pie, she's just gonna roll her eyes when I tell her she's dealing in non-dimensional numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you can anybody, try, try early. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions or thoughts or maybe want to share other approaches they might have that um, for the subject matter? While we're waiting for some questions, um, just wanted to remind you that um, information on this and all events can always be found on our website on geodynamics.org, including the recording of this webinar and past webinars. Um, and then our next webinar is going to actually be at a new date and time. So it'll actually be a Tuesday, April the 17th at 11 a.m. And this is to um, accommodate our European speakers, who would be Leon Kreischer and Martin Van Drill from Eta Zurich, and they will give us an update on OBSPI and um, Axisum developments. So I don't see any activity there. Um, thanks again, Eric, for giving this webinar, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Yep, thanks very much.